All right, guys. So the very last thing we have done, we spoke about uh, the area under the curve problem. Uh, Mohammed, uh, uh, I will send a message. I already did. It's at one o'clock. From one to three, I will give a review, another review for the final. We can just solve problems together and see what it is like. Another thing is on the website, you now have uh, a practice exam posted. So on the my open math website to be precise. All right. So again, what is the symbol integral from A to B of f of x dx? That means sum all the tiny thin rectangles um, from A to B. And f of x dx means what? What's dx? dx is the width of the rectangle. f of x is the height of that rectangle. Good. So we can do that by the right hand rule. So r sub n, which what we do is uh, we divide the interval from A to B into n parts and erect um, height of the rectangle at the rightmost edge of the interval, at the rightmost edge of the interval. Good. So that is, uh, that is uh, done as follows. So if I divide the interval into n parts, I have a delta x sub n, and that would be b minus a over n. Okay, and that just means a to b divided into n parts. Now, here is the scheme of my, um, of my construction. So this is the construction side. So what is x1? x1 is the first point at which um, I'm gonna plug this point into my function and figure out the altitude. And that would be the altitude of the first rectangle. At x2, I will construct altitude uh, at for the second rectangle and so on. Good. Now, how can you find a formula for, uh, for x1? So you can say, start at the point A and uh, move to the right, and move to the right. Good. And move to the right. And you can say this would be A plus uh, one times B minus A over N. At X2, I can say, well, start at A and move two blocks to the right. So it will be A plus two B minus A over N and so on. In general, I can think that in the right method, I can describe erecting the rectangle by moving to the right K unit. So A plus K delta XN equal to A plus K delta XN, right? You see what, what happens here? It means you start at A and you displace by K blocks. And uh, the size of the block is B minus A over N, okay? So the uh, Rn will be simply written this way, F of A plus K B, B minus A over N times B minus A over N. <clears throat> and this is now the formula. On the right is the formula, A plus K B, B minus A over N times B minus A over N. <coughs> you understand how that formula is supposed to work? And uh, the, <coughs> the very last thing we did last class the very last thing we have done in the last class is we calculated the integral from zero to two of x dx. And you notice, of course, that for such an integral, there is no need to use uh, any of those fancy procedures. Why? Because look at it. <coughs> this means that, uh, um, that the interval is uh, from zero to two. And at each x, what is this x dx? At each x, and x represents the height of the rectangle and dx is the width. So x dx, you can think of this formula saying, it's very suggestive, Leibniz created it. So if this is x, so the height of the rectangle is also x, right? And the width, which I make uh, a bit thick, that width is dx, that width is dx. Do you understand how that's supposed to work, guys? Good. So we know without doing any calculations <coughs> that the area should be, that this number should equal to two because it's a triangle. 
x dx is if I integrate x over the interval from zero to two. I'm really talking about uh, partitioning a triangle into many thin uh, rectangles of variable heights. Good. So the altitude is uh, of the tri triangle is just two and the width is two. And so the area has to be two times two times one half. So the area has to be equal to two if I do it correctly. So let's try to see that this is indeed what we obtain if I carry out uh, integration. <coughs> so the integral from zero to two of x dx, by definition, it's, uh, I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to go start at zero and displace to the right. Zero plus k times delta xn. And uh, what is del delta xn? It, it's this interval divided into n parts. So it's k times two divided by n. Do you see that? k times two divided by n. And the function, it's f of x equal to x. So whatever you apply to doesn't change the input. So f of k times two over n is k times two over n. So I have this right hand sum. The summation is uh, from one to n, f of xk delta x, uh, xn. This means I erect four rectangles. Where do we find the k? So k is, so you have to understand k is, is just, uh, it's just uh, how many units. k refers to the number of blocks displaced. So this summation uh, simply tells us to do the following. You see the summation? <coughs> it's just the, uh, the sigma notation. There is no k to be, uh, to be precise. This is just the sigma notation. to carry out the following, right? So delta xn, if the interval is uh, from a to b, it's b minus a divided by n. So th this tells me to do this. f of x1 times uh, uh, b minus a over n plus f of x2, b minus a divided by n, right? And onwards, f of x all the way to f of xn, times b minus a divided by n. That's what that formula is saying. Are you following me guys? Which is what? According uh, uh, to the displacement, if I start at the point a, this tells me to do this. Start at a and then move by one unit, b minus a divided by n. Plus stop, uh, start at a and move by two units. So those are the sums of the, I factored out the B minus A over N. Those are just the sum of the altitudes. And I need to multiply this by B minus A divided by N. And I take the limit as N goes to infinity. So that's the idea of the construction. So before I continue, would you please, and very fast, uh, I want to move today quite a lot. How much, well, do you understand the, the idea of this formula, guys? Do you understand what's happening here? <clears throat> yeah, you understand the idea, guys, right? Don't look at the symbols. See what's, uh, what's the idea. The idea is very simple. We just stuck a bunch of thin rectangles underneath the curve. Good. And uh, this notation, there is nothing more. There is no K. K is just a, you see, look at it. I wrote, uh, I used so much space here, but with this notation, with the Sigma notation, it's very short. That's all I'm doing there, right? I'm just trying to capture the idea that I am adding areas of many thin rectangles. Uh, so Miami, that's a great question. Uh, does the size uh, um, of the rectangles matter? Of course it matters. So let's look at the, at, the, at the picture, right? So you see, those are still exaggeratedly large rectangles. That's why you can still see the division. So the base of the rectangle has to be very thin. The thinner, the better. And what you do is you stack them underneath this continuous curve. You see what happens if they are very thin? it feels like uh, they are tracing the contour of the curve. The thinner they are, the better they trace the contour of the curve and the better they approximate the actual area. But all you are doing is, uh, you see, because, because if it's a curve, it's continuous from, 
from one edge of the rectangle to the next, there was very little opportunity for the curve to change. That's why the rectangles fit so snugly. See, whereas if the rectangle is very wide, there is a big opportunity from this point to that point to change in elevation. If the base is very, very uh, small, the height stays essentially the same. So for any point in that small interval, the height is, of the rectangle would have been essentially the same. And that's the idea. Are you getting it, guys? Good. Make sense? So let's move on. Again, we are testing this, uh, this procedure. Do you, do you understand what is that uh, uh, XK? XK is in this case for the right hand, that's why I say R sub N here, right? R sub N means that I decide to approximate the curve by producing N, where N would be a large number of rectangles um, underneath and pl placing them underneath the curve. So in, in uh, this example, the N rectangles that approximate this curve Will be uh, will be as follows. They are. So all I have to do is figure out what is the generic altitude f of x k. Now, because the function is x, it doesn't do anything to the input. F of x k is just x k. But what is x k? It's it's k displacements from origin, right? So x one is one displacement from the origin. X two is two displacement from the origin by that particular width, which is two over n, because I divide the interval from zero to two into identical segments. So it's k times two over n, right? So I have this formula, summation from k equal one to n, k times two over n times two over n. Now you understand this is just a sum. This is just a form of this, that, that, that the sum of the rectangles take. So here I see two over n and two over n, I can factor it out. So it's two over n squared, and I'm left with the summation from one to n of k. And we already figured out how to simplify the sum. What is the sum equal to? It's simply equal to the last number n, multiplied by n plus one and divided by two. You understand? So the summation may be replaced by n and plus one over two. Good. And then when you multiply it out, well, you don't even need to bother. Now you, what you have to do is take the limit as n goes to infinity because that when n is going to infinity, the thickness will decrease. We divided it in equals, in, you know, each rectangle has the same width. So if n is very large or if n goes to infinity, the approximation should become better and better leading to the predicted result of two. Do you see this is just now a limit at infinity? As n goes to infinity, what remains? Numerator is n squared times two squared. That's what survives in, that's what's important in the numerator. Two times n squared is what's important in the denominator, you agree? So I only pay attention to the leading terms and their coefficients. So here I will pay attention to, uh, to n squared and uh, the two squared. Here I will pay attention to the n squared and the two. So this looks to me right away as two squared n squared divided by two n squared. And the answer is two squared over two, which is exactly two. Good? Clear guys? Now here is, um, here is another example. Integral from one to four of two times three uh, X. Okay, slightly more complicated example. Now, I can easily figure out what this integral because, well, I can make it simpler. I can parcel it up. I can either do it all together or decide to parcel it up. You see two uh, and three X. So what is this? Uh, this is, this is the same as, uh, well, first of all, my function, my F of X here is two plus three X. You agree? That's the, basically the altitude of the rectangle over position X is going to be two plus three X. So how to actually figure what that might be? All you have to do is, if, is uh, let's say use the right hand method. You can say right hand method is just uh, you take, this is the construction scheme of the right hand method. So this would be one, this is four, and you move by, uh, by this would be one plus Delta X 
and this would and then you move again to the right that would be one plus two times delta x and on onwards you see that's the construction scheme here now what are um, the, the values here so if i divide into n rectangles you see what happens guys right divide this into n rectangles you just take four minus one and divide by n so you have three over n is the thickness of the rectangle of each base of each thin rectangle that you're creating there. So then I, I have to describe a generic point of construction, which is X sub K. Do you all understand this business of X sub K? It's like I'm telling you how to methodically construct X1, X2, X3, X4, X5. I can just uh, speak about a generic. It's like when I want to talk about all people, I speak about a generic man, right? Good. So for instance, uh, that's the common abstraction. If I were to say all Russians roll their R, what am I saying? I'm saying Arkady is Russian, Arkady rolls his R, right? And Boris is Russian and Boris rolls his R, right? And Dimitri is Russian and Dimitri rolls his R. You understand? I cannot go Dimitri, Boris, like I cannot go over all the million people individually. So I make a generic statement. So that right away applies to each individual. It's like I'm simultaneously talking about everyone. You follow? So what? that's exactly what X sub K is. It's just a generic, there is no K guys. You see, when you, when you pay attention to K, that means you are a nominalist. You are paying attention to the symbols, but not to the meaning. Okay, avoid that. That just means a generic point at which I erect my altitude. Good. So X sub K is one plus K times Delta X N. Good. That means start at the point one. Yes. Start at the point one and move to the right. K times delta x n. Yes. So it's one plus k times three over n. So this is now uh, the function evaluated at this x k will be two times plus three times x k. And here I simplify it. You see, I just write it's two plus three times what is delta x k. It's, it's uh, displacing from one by k width of that interval. So when I simplify it, I get five plus three k times uh, three over n. And then when I place it in the Riemann sum, all I do is I have the altitude of the rectangle multiplied by its width and I sum over all k from one to n, right? That, that, that indicates here that the altitudes change. That's why there is a K here. And here there's no K because the widths are staying the same. You understand? Based on the scheme. So what, what happens here now, I can sum five times three over N separately, and I can sum three times K times three over N times three over N separately. I just distribute the three over N and I break it into, into two sums. So the one sum here, it's five times three over N summation of just the number one. Now summing one from one to N, this will give me N. And the second part, I can factor out uh, uh, three multiplied by three over N squared. You see there's a three over N and another three over N and a three. So I can factor out three, three over N squared. And then I recognize my favorite friend, the K, right? Summation from one to N of, of K, which I can replace by N times N plus one over two. You with me guys? Right, so then uh, when I simplify it, I just take the limit. Uh, uh, once I simplify it, I take the limit as it goes to infinity. Here, the limit is five times three because n and n over n, <coughs> n over n, they cancel out, and I'm left with five over three, five times three, plus what survives in here, three, three squared, and on the bottom uh, um, just two. Right, so th so that would be three cubed divided by two. So the answer is 30 over two plus, um, because five times three is, is uh, 15. So, and, and I can write it as 30 over two plus 27 over two, which is 57 over two is my answer. You understand guys how I obtained it? It's nothing so hard. All you do is just manipulate uh, the algebra until you have uh, the situation here. All right, here is another example. Here we can calculate the integral from zero to two of x squared dx. Again, this is no longer so trivial. Like here, I could have used geometry to figure what it is. You see, if I draw it, it's just, uh, I'm, I'm integrating below a line, which means I'm dealing with a polygon, right? So 
uh, if I'm integrating two plus three X, what am I uh, more or less observing? I'm observing something like this. When I'm integrating a line in general, I'm observing this. So that can be always written as, that can always be solved geometrically as a uh, rectangle, some rectangle plus uh, some triangle. You see it? So I have the triangle area on top of a rectangle area. If, it's, if I'm integrating below a line, it's always easy to solve it geometrically. You follow that? So this procedure is in some sense needless. It's not making things easier. This is just like a training for, um, for um, carrying out this uh, Riemann sum and figuring integral this way. But in here it's x squared, right? So now when it's x squared, the curve is not, the, the skyline is not straight. So figuring out the area is no longer trivial. You agree? If, it, if I'm integrating a line, it's very easy. It's just some polygonal shape. I can always think of it as triangle over a rectangle so I can easily figure out the area for any line. But if it's x squared d, dx, that means my curve is uh, the parabola and uh, it's not straight. And so the, this Riemann procedure might give me some interesting information, something that I did not know how to obtain otherwise. So here is how I go about it. I divide the interval from zero to two into n small rectangles. So that would be two divided by n. Everybody understands the two over n? And then I have the typical point at which the rectangle will be erected. It will be xk, which is zero plus k times the size of the displacement. So it's k times two over n. Now, if I apply, uh, if this, this means this f of xk is the altitude of the rectangle over the segment k, the cave segment, right? From the left, you move to the right, that's the cave segment from left to right. So what you get is, um, what you get is k divided, uh, k multiplied by two over n squared. That's going to be your xk squared. And you add this thing up. So it's um, the altitude, k times two over n squared times two over n, right? And when you, now you, what you can do, you can take two over n squared and multiply it by two over n, you have two over n cubed and you can factor it out. And here is what you're left with guys, you see? It's two over n cubed multiplied by the sum k1 to n of k squared, yeah? Which is two over n cubed and the formula for summing up um, k squared is n times n plus one times two n plus one over six. Yes? n times n plus one times two n plus one divided by six. <clears throat> Which is what? Which is uh, simply, if I take the limit, all I have to pay attention to are the leading coefficients. So look at what I pay attention to here. So numerator, it's the same as the limit. This is the same as, as, as watch, watching um, two cubed multiplied by n, multiplied by n, multiplied by two n. That's the, that's the leading coefficient of the numerator, right? If I were to multiply it out, n times n times two n times two cubed will be my leading coefficient in the numerator. Whereas on the bottom, it is six times n cubed. Do you see that? So the answer is simply two cubed times two divided by six. Or in other words, the answer is, um, the answer is two cubed divided by three, right? Two cubed over three. Eight over three is my answer. You understand how I do it? It's just very quickly calculating limited infinity. So my answer is, eight over three. Now we can do in office hours, I will leave it to this question to office hours if you want to check if you can carry out this calculation on your own because uh, it, it takes time, okay? So let's say we can have this integral and see if you can set it up and uh, do that limit, right, by definition. Good, so I'm gonna skip this question for now. And there is another example, right? So we can go over those examples 
in office hours and they get more complicated you see here is another one they get more complicated and you can uh, uh, calculate those this way right now here is again uh, i'm trying to illustrate by such pictures what's going on right so this is a typical this is y equals f of x this is a typical rectangle erected below this curve now if you were to zoom in at that part of the curve, you see that, uh, that this part of the curve from xk minus one to xk, it's, it doesn't have to be necessarily a rectangle, but the idea is if it's very thin, there is very little difference in altitude, no matter where you pick the xk. I, I, I call it xk star this way. It could be the rightmost point, the leftmost point or anything in between. The altitude that you would have obtained for that rectangle would essentially be the same. And therefore in the limit, the area would have been the same regardless of where you decided to, to erect the altitude. Here, we just made it before in the procedure, we made it regularly the right end point, but it could be any point in this interval if the function is continuous. Do you understand guys, the idea of this picture? I'm trying to suggest that, uh, you see, I could have uh, erected it here and the difference would have been minuscule. And in the limit, there will be no difference because in the limit, when you make it very thin, there is just uh, over each rectangle, the continuous function is barely changing. To prove it formally, you see, you, you might, if you are uh, analytically minded, be worried that it, it does not always work and you would have been right. Uh, you, that's you doing analysis. You can prove it formally. And what you need for that is a proof uh, that uh, continuity over a compact interval is necessarily uniform continuity. So that, that then you can estimate the errors precisely using, by the way, delta epsilon type of thing, right? Where you can prove that no matter where you create the altitude, the result will be the same. You understand? Uh, in our class, I'm just going to say, uh, well, it looks like it would be. It's very highly intuitively, I think. Um, it's highly intuitive that the result will be in the limit the same, regardless of where I select the elevation. Of course, if you partition into finitely many rectangles, you do expect variation, okay? Because finitely many rectangles, you change the altitude a little bit, there might be a slight variation. But if you have uh, a partition that involves many, many rectangles, that variation will be barely noticeable. And in the limit, the idea is it will not be noticeable. Good? All right. So that, that's why I call it J sub N for general integral would be simply a limit as it goes to infinity delta X N F of X K star to indicate that I do not know if I erected it uh, in, at the right point or the left point or somewhere in between, right? That I expect uh, regardless of how I decide to construct my rectangles, I will obtain the same limit, good? Now let's see uh, if you are good at this idea, guys. Can you, and I, I need uh, you to do it very fast. Can you do that uh, in, all I want you to do is tell me uh, how to create the point XN. Can you express this integral as the limit of left, uh, uh, the left procedure? You understand what LN means? It means that I am selecting the left end point, right? So it means that if I start at A, there are several ways of doing it. So uh, if I start at A, this is uh, the first altitude. So that's the first, right? Second is here. And then third is here. You follow what I'm saying? In this scheme, instead of, uh, so this is one interval. This is one interval here, right? For that one interval, this is one interval here, yes? For that one interval, the altitude is on the left. Make sense? So instead of using right end point, you use left end point. So go ahead, uh, write in the comments, what should be my X sub K in terms of A, B, and if I'm displacing from the point A, or you can choose a different point to displace from, there is no restriction here. Go ahead, please type in the comments. All right, so uh, let's do it this way, right? I, I'm going to wait until I'm listening to, uh, to this uh, German report. Okay. 
You have a few moments. How is it going guys? Uh, are you close to the solution? Okay, Christian, you decided to go from B. That's wonderful. Makes absolute sense. Beautiful. What about the other uh, guys? How long do I need to wait? Do you want me to record uh, Nikrasov's poem as you are still working? The German guy is uh, quoting Nikrasov. Or are you ready? Should I give a Russian lesson as you're thinking, finish a Russian lesson, or are you ready to continue? Because you see what I'm doing, you can hear it uh, pretty much right over here. You see, I'm, I'm, it, we're so slow here that I'm supposed to be doing it in parallel. So what, are you ready or do I, do I correct the, uh, the German uh, pronunciation of Russian? Huh? Maybe I'll finish uh, writing War and Peace. <clears throat> hmm? God damn it. Let's do it together, I suppose, since there is I met by this uh, envious silence. All right. So here is uh, one way to do that, right? 
Christian suggested a very wonderful way to just start walking to the left from B. Why not, right? Look at it. It's like the right hand method if you walk from B, right? It's always moving farther. So you can walk uh, from B towards A and that will accomplish it, right? I, I might just, uh, I might do it one way or another. Here is one way to do it. It means I, 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 can, I can say that the KF interval, right? So I might, I might select first interval. I'm, I'm using A. So first interval, it's A. So that's for one A plus zero times delta X, right? Second interval is A plus one times delta X. And so what is the KF interval? It's A plus K minus one times delta X. You understand? You can do it like this, right? Notice it's, uh, it's always one minus the step. So you can do it like that. Okay, so the LN uh, procedure can be written as A plus K minus one, B minus A over N. That's how much you displace where K from, goes from one to N. K is uh, a particular rectangle, which I can re readjust. I can simply say K equal to zero to N minus one of F A plus K times B minus A over N times B minus A over N. You understand? This is nicer than writing K minus one here, I think, right? I prefer doing this. I just readjust the bounds from zero to N minus one. So that means that I will not quite reach the point B. So that's one way to do that. And here is another way which uh, Christian employed, right? They are very important to realize you can, uh, what Christian decided to do, he decided, well, let me start from B and move to the left. So starting at B, I am moving to the left and erecting altitudes this way. Obviously I will obtain the same rectangles, correct? Same rectangles, but just moving uh, from B. So that is why it's B minus K times B minus A over N. And notice this is K one to N. Yes. Here is uh, that other exercise. And here uh, you are trying to express, see if you, you're trying to express the integral from A to B, F of X DX starting at the point B and using the right uh, right hand rule. You understand? It has to be the right hand rule, which means that for each interval segment, you are seeing that the rightmost point is used to, to erect uh, the altitude. Do you understand what I'm asking? But I want you to start walking from B. So using the right hand point over the interval, in other words, I want you to do, uh, to do this procedure. So you go And you erect uh, obviously at B, then you move here, you erect here, you move here, you erect here, and onwards, right? Until uh, the last interval. This is A, this is B. Write me a Riemann formula for the generic integral from A to B, F of X dx, R end, right hand point, starting at B, please. Do it fast.
Okay, Christian. Beautiful. You you do it uh, except except uh, from zero to n minus one. You mean? Aside from that, you are right. Yes, Christian, one small mistake uh, up to n minus one. That's what I said. All right, so. <clears throat> Let's do it together. Guys, it, it should be instantaneous if you understand it well. Okay, so if not, it would be nice to see you in office hours, right? You don't stay enough. So we can start from B and, and the minus indicates we're displacing to the left, always to the left, right? So we don't want to displace um, in, uh, N intervals to the left, but only N minus one intervals to the left. So the answer is K equal to zero, all the way to N minus one, B minus K times B minus A over N times B minus A over N, right? So this is the formula for the Riemann sum. Then I, I bother you with the midpoint rule, but uh, I, I don't have time. Right, you should think of it uh, on your own. Now here is uh, another important exercise. Let's see how good you are at it. Identify the integral a to b f of x dx from those limits. You understand? You look at the limit and you say, oh, somebody was doing uh, what integral? What is the initial point? What's the final point? Maybe you can recognize what rule is being used, right? Is it the left-hand rule, the right-hand rule? Well, how do I, you, you use the construction, okay? So go ahead, here is A, B, C. Please tell me not what the answer is, but what is being integrated, what function. In other words, write it as uh, uh, integral A to B f of x dx, good? All right. All right, so let's go through it. All right, very simply, this is my xk, right? Where you see the k, that's the xk. The full thing is my function, right? So what's the function? It's xk squared plus one. So my function is x squared plus one. This part is the width of the interval, guys, right? It's just, um, so in your face. Now, what rule is being used here? So you can easily see what point we begin from because you set k equal to zero. If k is equal to zero, the initial point is three. And then set, regardless of this bound, set k equal to n, it's three plus two. Do you see? B is three plus two, which is five. So the integral is one way to write it. There is not a unique way. There are several ways to do it. Uh, three to five x squared plus one dx. 
You all follow how I did it? I just uh, identify the xk, I put zero. And then I see the initial value. I put n and I see three plus two, it's the final value. So it's three to five of x squared plus one. Good. All right, so now if that's good, at least one person shakes head and maybe it's not good. Tell me what is uh, happening here. What's the integral for b, please? Do it fast. Wonderful question. Very good. <coughs> so one person does it fast. What about the rest of you? Okay, on what? You look at it and you see something is being squared. Look at it, you see minus one plus k four over n, minus one k plus four over n, right? That indicates that that would be your xk. Because this means, what when you read it, you see, okay, minus one was the initial position and I displace by k segments of length four over n, yes? So uh, for b, the answer is very simple. It's the integral from what point? I can see I can begin at minus one and where do I end? So that if k is equal to zero, the point is minus one. If k is equal to n, it's minus one plus four, which is three. You see how I obtain the, the bounds of integration. Now what function? It's xk squared plus five x squared, xk plus seven. So the function is x squared Look at it, I see four over n and I see four over n here. They, they are the same. So it's x squared plus five x plus seven. And that's my dx here. Yes? Very simple. This is so. <clears throat> okay, and now, uh, and now this thing guys, this integral. So here I was using right hand rule. You look at now this expression, what's the integral for C? Yep. Yep, Christian, very obvious. Mm -hmm. 
Very good. Sumaya. What about the rest? Only what, two people? <clears throat> you see what you pay attention to. You have to see what is the width of the rectangle. Yes, ping ping. The weight of the rectangle is given here. Yes, Lisha. This is the width of the rectangle. You can see that it, it reappears in several places. Yes? It must be the same number, right? So it's just, if you read it, it must be intelligible to you that it's a blueprint for calculating uh, the areas of uh, many rectangles erected on what interval. You see? Just recognize a blueprint, nothing else. I mean, it's just areas of rectangle. How do I know that? Because they all have the same width and this is the height. The height is changing, changing because uh, it's different at different locations. So where do we have here? It's one plus K times one over N. One plus K times one over N. So this tells you how you displace. So what do we get? We get here the integral. Now ask questions if you don't see it guys. Integral. What's the initial value? I can say the initial value by letting k equal to zero, right? Because don't displace that. What, what, what's my leftmost edge? It's one. What's more, my, my rightmost edge? Just select k equal to n. This, 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 by the way, the n minus one here means that I'm using the left hand method, yes? I'm erecting the elevations at uh, the left. So that's why it's not quite reaching there. But the, the rightmost edge is if k is equal to n, it's one plus one. One plus one which is two. You understand that? This one plus, this is the length multiplied by n plus the full uh, length of the interval. Of what function? So this is root x plus e to the x multiplied by dx. As like simple as that. Now do problem number d. Stay after class if you're not getting it. Don't go, uh, don't go. We have an exam soon, final. Look at D, what's the integral? Okay, Alexa, it's the integral from, from careful, from what value? Uh, one or minus one? Uh, see, see, you see, where do we begin? You see there is a minus one and then uh, minus one to how much do we add at the end, right? So to what? You are right about the function, but from what, what is the bound? Okay, so uh, careful. Can you see the, can you correct it? Exactly. And then to what number, Alexa? From uh, minus one to what? Exactly, beautifully, right? So that's simply the integral from the very last one. 
the integral from minus one to zero e to the x dx. There are several other equivalent ways of doing that. You see equivalent formulas that will be correct. I will recognize all of them. Make sense? I hope it does. You see, uh, place k equal to zero, you get minus one. Place k equal to n, and you get minus one plus one, which is zero. What function? e to the x. You can see the width of the interval here, one over x, one over n, I'm sorry. Okay. Now we talk about uh, definite uh, integrals. So I'm not sure if you know what Spigmalion's Galatea or Rabbi Loves Golem, but the idea is this, once you give life to some idea, it will do what it does. It, is, it takes its own actions, its own decisions, you understand? So you intended the symbol to indicate uh, area under the curve. Now let's see what will happen if I uh, do the integral from a to b uh, uh, for f of x, where I'm assuming usually that b is bigger than a. Now what would happen if I drop those assumptions? What will change, okay? So, so this means simply what? Sum up areas, uh, uh, sum up areas of thin rectangular columns, which at x are uh, f of x high and dx y, those rectangles, right? So that's what this thing is saying. Now there is no reason uh, to, in general, suppose that we cannot use negative f. If it's negative f, of course, it will not be area, right? Because you can carry out the summation without regard to what uh, f is, whether positive or negative, right? So what would happen if the curve dips uh, below, right? If the curve dips below, what is it in terms of the areas a, b, and c? you can see that uh, the altitude over B is negative altitude. So it will be negative number times a positive width. So B will be taken as the negative area. Make sense if I erect a bunch of rectangles here because rectangles in the region B are pointing downwards, I add up negative area. Do you see that? So what is the uh, integral from, a, from little a to B? In terms of capital A, capital B, and capital C, it will be A, capital A, minus uh, capital B, plus capital C. You understand why minus? Because uh, uh, f of x dx, dx is positive, f of x is negative. Good? Now let's, uh, let's see what else do we, uh, what properties can we deduce about integration? So first property is that the integral of C from A to B, that just means it's a constant. So that, that is a rectangle of height C and uh, width B minus A. Good? So number one is obvious. If C is constant, it should be C times B minus A. Good? If I take two functions, F of X and G of X times DX and I integrate, it will be the integral of one plus, depending on is it plus or minus, plus or minus the integral of the other. That's also clear because of the algebra. It's just a, a summation of, uh, uh, of f of x plus let's say g of x times dx. So I can distribute the dx and break it into a separate sum involving only f and a separate sum involving only g. So this property, I hope it makes sense. Guys, confirm in, my, in the text that property number two, it makes sense to you, if it makes sense to you. It's a simple idea, yes? Because what is this? It's essentially a summation. Summation of f of x plus g of x times dx. So I can distribute the dx uh, through. Yes, it's really nothing more special than uh, the usual laws of uh, foiling, right? It's like distribute the dx. I distribute the dx and, uh, uh, and I have it ready. Yes? Distribute the dx, add things up. What is it in three? It's just uh, factoring out a constant, right? Through addition. If it's an, the addition, each, each summand has a constant c and I can factor it out, right? Now there are properties four, five, and six that uh, we want to talk a little bit more, right? So here again, one is just clearly just a rectangle. So I know right away that uh, the answer is uh, C times B minus A. 
I can kind of do it using Riemann sums and I see that as well. In B, I just added for addition, you see what happens. It's f of x uh, plus gx dx. I can distribute the dx and group together f and g separately, right? So that's why this is true. Um, yeah, that's in Riemann summation I'm showing. Uh, this integral is just limit as it goes to infinity of a finite sum and finite sums can be rearranged and then you take the limit, right? Now, uh, uh, this is also clear because uh, three is, as, as I mentioned, it's clear because it's just, uh, it involves uh, foiling or factoring out the constant C. Now, what about the integral from A to A of f of x d, d, dx? What would that equal? If, I, uh, if the bounds of integration are the same, What do you think is the answer immediately? Okay, Christian right away says it. What about the rest of you, fast? Okay, David says it, Khalid says it. Zero. The answer is zero. Why is it zero? Because uh, we have no width whatsoever, right? We can see that uh, using Riemann sums as well, right? We see that it's zero because why? Because the width is zero. Now, in terms of Riemann sums, if I were to do it uh, like a computer, and then I see, okay, well, I can use the right-hand method, displace from A by, uh, so A plus K, and what I have is a top point minus bottom point divided by N. Top point minus bottom point divided by N, but that's just zero, right? So that would be simply be f of a multiplied by zero. And I sum it uh, n times. So it's like I'm adding zero to itself uh, some, let's say a hundred times or a thousand times. And no matter how many times I add zero to itself, I, I am staying with zero, right? So the answer is zero here. Now, problem five asks this, pro this question. What happens to the integral if I interchange a and b? If, if A is on the bottom and B is on the top, what would happen if I switch and say B is on the bottom and in A on the top? You can answer this question immediately if you uh, do it formally, because if B is on the bottom and A on the top, that means what? That means that it's the limit as if I use the right-hand method, right? It's, it's simply formally, it just means uh, what if you have a box and a triangle here, it's F of triangle. Uh, Yes, yeah, so you, you can, you can, you, so I think here I meant uh, um, not a triangle, you, you take the, the, you can take the bottom uh, segment, it's a box plus k tri triangle minus box divided by n, yeah? So the idea is very simple. The idea is, if I have this guys, if I have a, so if I have b to a, What am I really doing? I'm taking the limit, let's say if I use the right hand point, the right hand rule, it tells me to carry out the summation, k equal one to n of f of the first point, the bottom point plus top point minus bottom point. So it's a minus b divided by n multiplied by k, right? Multiplied by top point minus bottom point over n. Is this clear? Okay, Gabriel, of course, if you have to go, you have to go. Okay, do you all understand this guys? You see the formally I just take top point minus bottom point to calculate the width, right? But let's assume for a moment that A is smaller than B. So I see bigger point here and A is small. So uh, let me just rearrange the summation. So this is the limit as N goes to infinity of what? Of K equal to one to N F of B and I can place here minus k b minus a over n, yeah? Times 
because there is this uh, other thing I can I can factor out negative in here and here I can write and b minus a over n right where here I factor the negative and look at what we get here Christian do you recognize it this is the left hand rule for uh, the integral so this is just simply in the limit minus the integral from a to b f of x dx do you see that because we started with the right hand rule uh, for the top integral and we end up with the left hand rule this is the left hand rule for the same function with a negative sticking out yeah you understand guys how i did it i just followed uh, formally the procedure and i believe that here i made a glitch here i wanted it to be a square here right it should be a square i think right so what you have is uh, f of uh, the square plus the triangle minus square yeah times k good so problem number six are you following guys right i hope you are uh, you're able to take this not so massive information but who knows how you process it right so then what happens if i take a point c that's pretty interesting guys right look at it if i have the integral from a to b of f of x dx and i take a point c as an interim point it always happens to be that the integral is from a to c and then from c to b this might be clear if you think that c is between a and b if c is between a and b then uh, it's like you partition the area from a to c and then from c to b but this is true even if c is outside the interval it's always true let me try to uh, illustrate it or talk about it okay so here is uh, again what what this is saying why is that uh, true if if the curve let's say is intuitively if the curve is positive and c is between a and b then we then the full area the, the full rectangles um the full air sum of the rectangles is the rectangles from a to c plus the areas of the rectangles from c to b so that's obviously clear the clearly true if c is between but what happens if c is to the left of a if c is uh, uh, to the left you understand i want to show you that regardless of the location of c this is always true if c is to the left of uh, of a and a is smaller than b then what we have is this the integral from a to c plus the integral from c to b is uh, what it can be written as uh, the integral as minus the integral from c to a because you see integral from a to c i can always by the previous idea i can always flip them and uh, and just multiply by minus one you understand that guys what we just proved uh, a moment ago is that the integral from a to b of f of x dx is minus the integral from b to a f of x dx i and what this means is i can always uh, flip the signs of the integral and multiply by minus one and that then will not change my uh, integral at all okay so then if I have integral from A to C plus integral from C to B, I can uh, change this and write it as minus the integral from C to A. We're assuming C is smaller than A, so I want C to be on the bottom, right? Minus the integral from C to A plus the integral, and this I can break apart, right? Now, uh, this would be the, the integral from C to A because it's from C to B. So C to A and then plus the integral from A to B. And look what happens here. This integral and that integral cross out and I am ending up with integral from a to b f of x dx. Do you understand what I'm saying guys? Or you entirely just use you, your symbols a, b, a, b. Do you understand me? I am just showing you something pretty, hopefully that you understand it's pretty remarkable. C does not have to be in the middle for uh, this property to hold, right? The integral from A to B is always going to be equal to the integral from A to C plus the integral from C to B. This is clear if C is in between. I hope it's clear if C is in between, yes? Write in the comments, is it clear when C is in between? Comments, guys. Presence of the polls, please type yes or no.
Okay, no. Thank you, Alexa. Well, and, uh, and others? Not really, okay. We will finish as soon as we are done with this point at least, okay? Here is, uh, so first, first of all, guys, let's consider this picture. We have A and B. Yes, and here is a curve. Good. Now, those people that said no, tell me what's the, so this is the curve y equal f of x. Tell me please, what does the integral a to b f of x dx represent? Would anybody dare to speak or type comments? Area under the curve, uh, yes. And, and more specifically, it's the rectangles that, uh, yes, area under the curve is good. It's the rectangles uh, summed from A to B, right? That's how it's expressed. Now, if I select a point C in between, so here is some point C in between, right? Now, the area uh, under the curve here can be thought of as the sum of the areas of this area, call it A1, and this area, call it A2, do you agree? So this is equal to A1 plus A2, which is, what is A1? In A1 is the integral from A to C, f of x dx, plus the integral from C to B, f of x dx. Yes, is it clear now? that uh, if I put a point C in between, it should be that, uh, um, you know, each of them can be expressed as uh, integrals. It should be clear that this integral is the sum of those uh, two other integrals. So Alexa, um, did I clarify it? And uh, somebody else said also not really, maybe Alicia, I don't remember who said it. Yuzu, right? Is it clear? And Irvin, let me know, guys. Yes? Clear? Okay. Now, what I was trying to say is uh, that is that this is even so, even if I uh, select the point C to the left of the curve. So here is A. Here is B. And let's suppose I select uh, the point C here, right? My claim is that the integral from A to B of F of X DX happens to be still uh, the same thing as the integral from A to C F of X DX plus the integral from C to B F of X DX, you understand? So in this picture, uh, the C is not partitioning the uh, this area, right? See, it's entirely in a different location, you see? This is the area that I am interested in, right? And the integral from A to B represents this red region. But here I introduce a C that uh, is to the left of uh, this region. I can still break the interval from A to B into the integral from A to C plus the integral from C to B. Do you understand what I'm trying to show? I, uh, so it's a little less clear than in the previous picture, but you understand that I'm claiming that it's still going to hold. Are you with me, guys? Okay, what about the rest of you? Especially people that were skeptical before. Yes? 
Yeah. Okay, so do you see what, how am I going to show this? So how am I going to show it? Now C is less than A. So this integral can be written. So look at it. Uh, the integral from, here is, a, I'm, I'm doing it this way. So the integral from C, so from A to C of F of X dx, plus the integral from C to B F of X dx happens to be what? So C, look at the picture guys. C is to the left. So uh, the integral from A to C, that's one thing that you have to understand. It's the same as minus the integral from C to A, F of X DX. If you haven't understood that proof that I explained, you should stay after class, right? I'm gonna finish in a few moments. You should stay and we should discuss that. Isn't what supposed to be minus? So I'm not, I'm not finished. So, the, so A to C, it's the same as minus uh, C to A. Okay, if I put a minus, I can reverse uh, the integration signs. I can, I can flip uh, the bottom to be the top and the top to be the bottom. Okay, and then what? And then uh, uh, from C to B, there is a, the point A is in between. So I can say this is the integral from C to A of F of X DX plus the integral from A to B of F of X dx. So they uh, cancel each other out. So this and that will cancel each other out. And I still get that the sum of those integrals from A to C, from C to, and then uh, from C to B is the integral from A to B. Even though the point C is not between A and B. You understand? And you should come up with a similar proof that if C is to the right of B, in other words, the other case C is to the right of B, that's also true. If the integral from A to C plus the integral from C to B ends up being the integral from A to B, regardless of where C is located. Good? Good? And so I wish you with this information, I suppose I have to wish you farewell, even though I would not mind uh, uh, continuing the lecture onwards. So I'm gonna stop the recording here. We have, guys, uh, very little time remaining. Please read my notes and think about them carefully. If there is anything that you don't understand right now, overcome yourself, stay with me for office hours. Don't leave. You know, uh, I, was, I was the other day talking about MIT students. You see, there is this guy that uh, he went to Hunter to recover. Now, why, why did he need to recover? He worked himself to nearly to death. He actually worked himself so hard that he had a heart attack and then a stroke, right? So this is what I want uh, us to be. Slightly minus the heart attack, right? We'll, we'll, uh, we will remove that a little bit, right? We need to work very hard. That's how you achieve um, tremendous success, if you don't have a stroke, of course. All right, so I'm stopping the recording.